This is the Matt Beck Podcast. Today's episode is powered by MinervaBeauty.com. What's up, guys? Welcome to the Matt Beck Podcast. Today's episode is powered by uh, my friends at MinervaBeauty.com. Let me uh, throw up their site here. MinervaBeauty.com has the best salon furniture and selection. And also, the cool thing about Minerva Beauty is that they stock pretty much everything. So when you order it, it actually comes that day. It doesn't have to ship from China and take weeks and weeks and weeks to get in. I just got some really cool color trays uh, in stock or in the salon. They just sent them to me yesterday. So I'm really excited to uh, share that stuff with you guys as well. Today is a very exciting episode. Well, I mean, literally since last time he was on the last episode too. So I haven't done, I haven't done it. I haven't done an episode since last time. But Jason, it's been the most exciting episode <laughs> since the last one. Yeah, yeah. This is so exciting because it was just yeah. as exciting as last time. Jason, welcome Boom. to the show. So, uh, dude, technically this is our show at this point. I like it. I like it. At the intro. So, uh, so Jason, uh, if you guys don't know who Jason Everett is, he uh, has a company called High Performance Salon Academy. Um, really yeah. cool. Uh, we're going to talk tons of stuff today, commission based stuff. Um, but you're pro commission, which is my favorite thing. Like, <laughs> I just love that. Like, we talked about this last time, but the industry shifts and you've built this company uh, that caters to building big businesses within the salon industry, which is. Uh, yeah. really exciting and you know it keeps the i think it keeps the the integrity of uh the industry because i think you should have all of it um but i like that you do you know both so welcome yes sir dude so, glad to be on thanks for doing this man you do a great job and it's always awesome to be on your show like i i tell you all the time it's always hard to keep up with the coolness of matt beck but you know the rest of us mere mortals do what we can you know i, I think it's funny because you're the easiest person to have on the show because like it's hard to do this with anybody else because we both like this stuff just as much. Like we could, yeah, we could just true. sit here and talk about the stuff it takes to put on a live show uh, just as much Bro. as actually doing the show. So it um, might, the amount of camera cases and things and stuff is enormous. <laughs> so I feel you. Yeah, for sure. So all right, let's. Um, yeah. I want to get in. We'll just jump right into questions so we can start uh, doing some stuff for some people let's do here. It. Um, I did put out a awesome. questionnaire thing. I asked for people's questions on Instagram. So uh, that's where mm -hmm, we're pulling mm -hmm. from. The first question is from the worst name on Instagram. It's got to be the worst name. Uh, how can I market <laughs> myself outside of social and work to gain my own clientele to bring to my salon? And at what point in your career do you say goodbye to commission uh, and go booth rent? Any tips, advice on that would be awesome. So I thought this was the perfect question for you. Dude, you're such a disturber. You're like, you like to stir it. Yeah, you're like, this is perfect. Let's chat about this. Yeah. Well, so, can I, can I just say, man, that question is the question. I mean, you nailed it. it really like, is. dude, uh, fla flavor saver. Is that what it was? Right. <laughs> flavor saver. Yeah. Um, by the way, I don't think that's a horrible name. I think it's awesome. I think it's creative. I actually, um, <laughs> it is creative. I shouldn't say horrible. it's, it's creative, <laughs> but fla flavor saver. I like it. Yeah. Um, and it's only, I only say that cause it's more creative than something I would do. Cause I just use my damn name. That's all. Oh, for sure. Um, I mean, but yeah, it, he, right. It right. The creativity. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so dude here, that's the question, right? Is like, you know, people are like, and, and, and here's the thing. I, I, it's such a, this is such a good question. I'm so glad you pulled that one first because yeah. this question is like, what's wrong with the industry in one question. Yeah. That's it. Like that's exactly what's going on. Right. If somebody said, look, um, Work like let me let me go a little deeper in this comment. How I perceive it, right? Is look, they say, look, I'm working for a salon. It's okay here. I don't really like it that much. I'd rather just do my own thing, go off on my own. I don't like the owner that I'm working for, and I'm ready to go booth rent because it sucks here. It's not giving me what I need, what I want, where I want to go. I don't see my future with what I'm doing. And so you know what? Screw this. I'd rather go do something on my own. Go booth rent because this environment blows. That, that's yeah. basically what this is saying. So out of desperation, they now have to become a business owner of yeah. their own salon 
because the salon owner is failing, in my opinion, and, no, and like I'm sure, like the salon owner of Flavor Savor is going to be on this podcast and be like, screw you, Jason. But here's the thing. Like yeah. what's happening is that's a failure of ownership to recognize talent, to uh, treat people well, and grow people. Because if you don't continue to grow people, then people will leave. Like, that's it. Like, I, I read this quote the other day that said, um, it said, treat your employees, or it said, it said, grow your employees. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. But it's like, it was like, grow your employees so well, they can leave you. Treat them so well, they'll want to stay. Yeah. That's and and so here's the thing. Yeah, this is good. I don't even remember who said it. So yeah. I'm not taking credit, but it's somebody else, right? And here's the thing, is that what I teach is, that you don't want your staff to go build up their own clientele. You don't want them to necessarily know how to market and advertise and build themselves up and do all these things. Like your job, like if that staff member is having to advertise for themselves to build up their own quote clientele, it's because the owner probably doesn't even know how to do it. And so they're relying on whatever walk-in traffic and like maybe the owner throws them a couple clients when they can or whatever it is. But that person says, screw it. I'm going to be responsible for my own destiny because the owner's not taking care of me. And, and I don't mean to yeah. blame the owner. I think it's industry-wide that people have thought that like all you have to do is like rent a space, go buy some chairs from Minerva, clearly from Minerva, but like go buy right. some stuff from Minerva and magically you have your own space and voila, I own a salon. But they don't know how to be a leader. They don't know how to how to manage people. They don't have team meetings. They hate their own team meetings. And it creates this huge problem where everybody just goes, F it, I'm going to booth rent. Yeah. And then the issue comes to where now you're on your own. And mm -hmm. being on your own is fine. Like this is the thing where there's the the beauty in being your own boss, right? And having your own hours and all that stuff. All that stuff looks great. But then once you move into being a booth renter, what is the future Good. like? And that's the scary part. It's yeah. like, well, yeah. do you know, like at that point you have to start investing. Like for me, it's like as a salon owner um, or as a commission stylist or whatever, but like, let's say you're going to go open something, right? If mm -hmm. you're just doing it on your own, the future has to be, well, how are you investing the money that you're bringing in? And, and what does, what does the future look like? I've always looked at it. Like I didn't want anything to ever be really a, about me. I, I like things being about me, from, from like, uh, you know, being the guy on the internet or whatever, but from a business standpoint, sure, sure. like I didn't name my salon, my name, I didn't, uh, right. you know, want my education to be me. Like, I don't want that because I'm trying to build something bigger than me. You know what I mean? So yeah. like, I think people have to think about that when they go into what are you creating? And like, if you do, I know some guys that, um, they do booth rental, but they're, also really highly into education and building an education company. Right. For me, it's like, okay, yep. well do that. Cause that gives you the freedom to then go travel and work. That's hard to do when you work in a commission salon or on commission or whatever, totally. and you don't have that extra yep. income. So, you know. Yeah. And so dude, I think, I mean, that's the thing It's like, you know, I, when the last podcast I had somebody tell, I think I told you this, but I had some guy message me and he said, I could see on your face that you hated booth renters. So I want to talk to you because he was all like pro, like, you know, pro commission hated booth rent. But here's the thing. It's not that I hate booth rent. There's times and places to booth rent. Yeah. And it's like, you know, there's some people who are like, look, I want to own my own salon. So I go booth rent for a while. And then they move to a commission salon and they build their own team because they want to do it better than the, the owner that they were working with before. Like, I get it. And to your point, sometimes you're a traveling educator. Or the other thing is a lot of like, quote, influencers. Like, this is the other yeah. thing. I just I just got back from doing a Red Can Artist Connection. And they wanted me to speak on influencers. And we're doing this like 30 day influencer challenge, which, by the way, you, you know, I've, I've roped you into. Right. And yeah. like, it's one of those things that like, when I talk to people who want to become influencers, sometimes their lifestyle can only function in a rental environment. Sometimes that's the case. And depending on what type of salon they work at, right? But it's not that like booth rent's horrible. It's that booth rent is a symptom of a leadership deficit inside commission salons right? It's like, yeah. you can't hold your staff hostage. You can't just assume that like, well, I gave you a space to work. Don't you love coming to work here? Because it's a good building. It, it's pretty decor. It's all these other things. And it's like, business is so much more than just pretty decor and a good space to work. But in the salon industry, they've treated it that way. So guess what happened is that everybody goes, well, I'm just basically renting a suite anyway, but giving you more than 50% of my commission. So why don't I just go leave and do it on my own? And then they have to become 
they have to run the rest of the business. So here's here's the other danger that happens. And by the way, like I, I don't know if I'm answering that question. I'm totally not. I'm diving around the first question we had. But yeah, here I think what happens is that so often people go out and they start a salon. Like I talked to this gal the other day. She's like, I have a staff of three. Uh, I want to be a commission salon. But I, I, and I said, well, what's your goal? She's like, I'd like to have four people in my salon. And I'd like to only work one day a week behind the chair and let everybody else do the work and me not have to do anything. And I was like, well, that's not what a commission salon is about either. No. Is they think that like I can go from being a one chair booth renter to opening a, a salon of three people, letting them do all the work and then they get to retire. That's what people think. And I'm like, no, no, no. You need to decide if you're going to be a commission salon, how do you grow to half a million or a million dollars to actually grow a legitimate business that can work? And at that stage, you can make an owner income, you can make a behind the chair income, and you potentially have an asset that's worth something down the road. Because again, you talked about future proofing, right? Well, you didn't say future proof. I'm saying that. But like, right. you know, how do you grow a business that like in the future is worth something to somebody else? Three people in a tiny salon that all just kind of work whenever they want to work is not really an asset. It's just something that like, it's a job that you get to work with your homies at. Right. But in, as hard as that is. So let's talk about this because when you, when you look at a commission salon, so I have five, I think we have five staff. Uh, yeah, five. Um, and when you have like my salon doesn't really, it makes money. It makes enough money to survive. Right. But I have this other business. Right. So, and, and it was a goal of, of yeah. me and my wife, like, we have this other business. Let's keep the intimacy of what our salon is. So it's a different story. And that's what we right. we're talking about. There's a lot of different instances mm -hmm. where you do different things. Um, but right. in your mind and you working and coaching other salon businesses, do you think there's a certain number that's the sweet spot of like, what have you found like from a profitability or profitability standpoint, like that kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah, so there is a sweet spot. And again, Matt, I want to be clear on on numbers because sometimes I talk yeah. numbers with people and they start freaking out. And I mean that like, oh, three people or five people or whatever. There, there's some, right. um, there's some like, uh, what am I trying to say? Like averages that I'm tuned into. And like there's, you know, there can, there could be a salon that has three people that does a million dollars a year. So it's not right. always like three people that do, like I've had salons say they have three people and they do $100,000 a year. And I've had salons who have three people who literally have told me they do $750,000 a year, right? So it, it's it's just kind of a range. What I would say, at least in my experience, is that for salons that are in a mode where they're kind of to their first half a million and maybe $750,000, that at that part of the business, like from zero to 750, roughly, Right. is when you're building the business and you have to be working behind the chair to make money there because the business doesn't have enough extra income to really pay an owner's salary and business. Now, there's probably somebody who would be on here who's making 300,000 like, "Oh no, I make this." But here I want to break down these three things cuz I think they're super helpful. Yeah. There's behind the chair income, right? You work, you get paid like a commission stylist. Okay? There's that one. Then there's management income that you make for running and managing the business. That'd be like if you had to hire somebody else to do that job, they'd get that position. They run one-on-one -on -one meetings. They run the advertising. They do the accounting. They do all these other things. Now you can break that up and pay an accountant and you can pay a manager and you can pay all these people or you can keep it all for yourself and run behind the chair half the time and a business half the time. Those are two yeah. types of like employee income that come from a salon. Then the third income from a salon is the profit. Meaning after you've paid the staff, after you've paid yourself as a behind the chair owner, after you've paid the management salaries, what's left over from the business is what's considered right. the salon owner profit, which starts to kick in at that 500 to 750,000 and then gets a little stronger at about a million dollars. Like that starts to kick on, kick in. Then there's a fourth income that most people don't really get into. And I, I think you're familiar with this. It's called owning the building that you're in because you have a business right. that has to pay rent. So either pay yourself rent or pay somebody else rent. And some salons have been in a building for 25 years, basically paid off the building for whoever owned the building, or you could pay it off for yourself. And that's the fourth stream of income. Now, are there other incomes that you could have in there? Of course, but those are the main streams of income. And when we talk about a booth renter, the only possible option of income for that booth renter is income number one. When you work, you get paid, period. Right. And that's what people need to like really think about. 
But here's the thing, and this is where people go into it. They don't want to be a salon owner that owns a commission salon. They just want to do hair. Is it if you're just doing hair in a commission salon or what are the benefits of being in a commission salon in your opinion, the salons that you work with, not all of them, right? Yeah. So like this is what other people need to understand as well. If you work in a commission salon at my salon, you get your health insurance, you get, you know, different benefits that go along with it, mm -hmm. right? If you work yep. in other people's commission salons, it's not necessarily, there might not be any other benefits other than, you know, the, the norm. So tell me like, yeah, yeah. what are you coaching yeah. your commission well, that's salons it. on? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. I mean, I, I think, you know, at its basic premise at like the high level, like a motivational quote on Instagram level, it's like, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with somebody else, you know, like that, that's the Instagram level quote. Okay. is like, it's better with a team, but why is it better as a team? Well, yeah. dude, you mentioned a great example is like health insurance. Like when we talk to commission salons, we talk about what are all the benefits besides a place to work and education? Right. Yeah. Like what, what else is there? And so like, for example, like if you, here's a, a difference for like a commission salon versus a renter. If a commission salon has 10 or 15 people or even five people and you decide you want to go rent a booth at a bridal show and you're going to go shell out a thousand dollars or $2,000 to go do that. If you were a single renter going to shell out money to go advertise at a bridal expo, it might be extremely cost prohibitive to do it. But when you have five or 10 people on your salon and you split up that workload, now all of a sudden you kind of, you have an, an extra exposure for advertising and marketing. You can go out and you can actually grow what you're doing long-term. Um, the other big advantage that I see for, for commission salon owners that that's, can be really important is they offer additional positions for growth. Meaning if at some point, these fingers do not last forever. Now I don't cut hair, so my fingers might last a little bit longer, okay? But for a right. lot of people, they they use their hands and fingers every day and they're like, well, look, I'm only 20 something. I'm only 30 something. I'm only 40 something. I don't wanna retire, so this doesn't really matter now. But you know what? In order to be in a position, and this is the craziest thing, in order to be in a position as a, as a stylist, behind the chair stylist, and be able to make money without having to cut hair, it's about a 10 year process to build up any sort of income besides behind the chair. Yeah. So like, if you think about that, that, that one advantage of being in a commission salon, maybe growing into management, maybe then going into education, maybe then going into shareholder or maybe buying out the salon owner that could take five or 10 years. And I think there's a lot of 20 somethings that are like, I don't want to wait that long. I just want to go rent a booth. I want to, you know, get my money right now. But then all of a sudden it's like, you've literally cut off your future because you can't like, you can't like call up another stylist and say, I'd like to sell you all my clients here. Give me, give me $50,000 to retire, which by the way, you'd never retire on 50 grand, but like give me <laughs> right. 50 grand and I'll give you all of these wonderful people who, by the way, only love me because I'm so great. And I'll give them to you and they might try you, but they'll probably never come back a second time. They'll just go right. find some other random stylist. And yeah. it's like you, you cut off your future in that scenario. Now, again, you mentioned yourself in this. For you, this business of free salon education and the Matt Beck brand of like what you do internationally and globally is like that is another business for you. So like that, you know, you can do that's not, you're not cutting hair right now. Like you've got other things that make you money and that's cool. So yeah. you, that's, you know, and but you've also got your streams of income from the salon and from the business side. So I think part of it is in benefits like having, you know, uh, Benefits like having paid day, days off, vacation days. <laughs> Part of it yeah. is being able, you know, like actually like, wouldn't it be cool if you didn't have to go to work and you still got paid instead of like saving, squirrel, uh, squirreling away your nuts. Is that what they say? Right. Like putting all your money aside so that you can take two weeks off because you know that everyone you have to work your face off for a couple of weeks. So you make extra money so you can then take some time off and then come back to working your face off. It's just like do you value the safety, security, and the the comfort of being able to work in a commission salon that takes care of you well? And I, that, by the way, that doesn't mean, and this is another question that comes up. I'm just going to keep rolling. But like, yeah, a lot of times stylists work in a commission salon and they're like, you know what a commission salon could do to take care of me? They could pay me more commission, right? right. Like, oh, I make 40% now or 45% now. If that salon just paid me 60% commission or 70% commission, then I'd be, quote, taken care of. Well, look, first of all, you got to remember, there's way more to run a business than just like 
you know, the rent on the building. Like it's just ridiculous the amount of stuff that a, sal that a salon owner has to do. And if you ran a commission salon at some point, you'll figure that out. But like the the what most stylists go is they just go increase my commission and I'll be happier to stay. But what I look at is like when we sit down with commission salon owners and say, how do you talk to your team? We have all these really cool tools. Actually, I don't know, maybe I'll show you one of these at some point. But like we have these cool tools that like you go in and you figure out, well, how many new guests do I need? What's my retail to service dollars? What are these things? So the idea would be that the salon owner or manager for that commission salon can coach you to make more money without having to work your face off behind the chair or even having to increase your commission. They coach you on how to do that, like how to actually get you comfortable selling more retail to the clients and product or to the to clients who walk through the door inside the salon because here's an extra five bucks here, 10 bucks there, whatever. And the end of the month, you're like, holy cow, I just made another couple hundred dollars. Like I had a nail tech who just went through a challenge with us. She normally does about $1,500 a month in retail. That's the most she normally does. She just okay. did $3,500 a month in retail, 3,500 in retail, oh, because wow. I just gave, I gave her new questions to ask when she's talking to people. And she's like, it was super easy. More people just bought stuff. And I went from $1,500 to 3500 And you know, and she gets commissioned really well on retail products. This is the thing that, that kills me every time. Like people, people talk about, and I put out a post a, a while back and I think you saw it, but like, um, it was about like, I'd rather have, you know, 40% of $150,000 than 60% of 50,000. You know what I mean? And it was like this whole, right. and a right. lot of people got upset about it because they want 60% commission and not 40%. The point yeah. is whether you make 60 or 40, it doesn't matter if you're not opening your mouth and actually talking about the right things while, while somebody's in your chair, actually it's the same thing with this podcast. If we're not giving you advice that actually helps you and we're just talking about, that's why I hate interviews. Cause I think they're they, they fluffy bring, stuff. They bring no point to anybody, right? They don't. So mm, I think mm. for me, it's like, well, I could talk about Jason's life and, and you could bring benefit or we could talk about this stuff and then people fall in love with Jason. Right. And they want to figure out who he is. It's the same thing behind the chair. If you're not bring, if your conversation isn't bringing something to the people, the person in the chair, then you're not going to sell anything and they're not yeah. going to benefit from it. Like you should only be totally. talking to the thing, about the things that you truly believe in. If you don't believe in the products, yeah. then you have the wrong products. Um, and you should really be trying to help that person that's behind the chair or that's sitting in your chair instead of, you know, all the other random things that we talk about and, and you see it and then you're like, I, I can't sell retail. Well, you didn't talk about it or, you know, I, I can't get people to rebook. Well, you didn't talk about it. You didn't, you didn't mm -hmm. just bring up the fact, you know, like, so those it, are it's like, that, it's like a pendulum. Yeah. It's like people have swung the other way. So like I was just, I heard, I heard there's a buddy of mine named Simon Bowen who said this the other day. He said, sales used to be about like crappy sales tactics, right? Is like, you know, like uh, here's a puppy dog clothes or here's this type of clothes. And it was all these tactics, but sales has changed from tactics to transparency. Yeah. That, that's changed. That's a good In the point. last five years, it, it's like, it's super important. And again, this is for my buddy Simon, but like it, it what happens is, People in a salon say, I don't want to sell because I don't want to be sleazy and I don't want to like take advantage of my client. I love my client. I love my customer. I don't want to rob them, steal from them, whatever. So this pendulum idea, what you're exactly talking about, Matt, is like it swung from like, I don't want to take advantage of my client. So they're way over here. So they actually run away from retail sales. Yeah. Now, because it's called sales, that's like the dirty word, right? It's like, it's called sales. They're like, well, I don't want to do that. But if I said, well, what if instead of being about sales, it's about serving? And like, if you were, if like, if let's say I went to a restaurant and I made a steak and some other food at a restaurant, but like I didn't season the food, would I be doing the customer a service or a disservice? I'd be right. told, like, I'd be like, look, I didn't want to, I didn't want to flavor your food because I didn't want to like, I didn't want to like have to sell you some salt and seasoning. And like, I just know it's, it's more expensive for me to put seasoning on the food. And like, I just, I just, I didn't want to like try and like, I didn't, it's going to cost you more money. I didn't want to take money out of your pocket. And like, I didn't want to offer you like dessert because it's just dessert is like, I mean, it's such a decadent thing. And like, you know, so and they end up doing things like, um, you don't like you don't want to buy any retail products before you leave today, right? I didn't want to push any on you. You don't want to buy any, right? It's like going to a restaurant and them going like, I know you didn't want dessert, so I didn't even bring it up. Right. I'm like, what the F? Like, I'm here, and this is the craziest thing to me. I go to a salon and I go, look, 
There's things I love about my hair. There's things I hate about my hair. If you can accentuate the things that I love and fix the things I hate, I yeah. will hand you my money. That's what yeah. I'm doing. That's what I'm here for. And it's then they funny. like, they do, they miss it. Yeah. We, we, uh, actually tonight's the, the night. So we take our son to this lacrosse practice and there's like a window where you sit at this food only bar and you can watch them practice mm -hmm. or whatever. Right. And so we go there every Thursday and they just opened this restaurant in there. And so me and my wife, we go and we sit down and there was like two nights where we went there and we sit down and you know, they want you to eat food there. They don't want you sitting at their right, bar clear. and watching right. your kid and then just leaving and not buying anything. Right. But there's right. like, yeah. you know, younger people working there and I don't know, they're just not trained well, I guess. Cause it, I don't know if it just opened yeah. or whatever, if that's why, but we're sitting there and they don't once say, here's a menu or would you like something <laughs> to drink? Like nothing happens. Right, so right, we're right. sitting there and we just right. watch and then we get up to leave and they're like, thanks for coming. And we're like, yeah, you're like, awesome. Great business. Yeah. Well, and it's, we it's because, and again, this food. goes back we, to, you know, yeah. If they just would have dropped you a menu, that's the thing, right? Is like, um, it, people are so afraid to sell right now because they see selling is bad. And, and I would agree. Selling is bad. Like the, yeah. Selling is bad. Serving is good. And if you serve your client well, like if, if this is always the thing I, I make this argument, if a, if a customer came into your salon, Matt, and like you were busting out Pantene Pro V to shampoo their hair or herbal essence or, you know, tail and mane or whatever, and you were using that in the salon, <laughs> then cool. I don't know what it is, right. but like, <laughs> it's right. It's like the horse shampoo. <laughs> oh, thank you. You're thank welcome. you for schooling me on said mane and tail, uh, <laughs> tail and mane. But the the whole thing is like you would never do that in the salon. You like you treat their hair like royalty in the salon, but then you allow them to go listen to advertisements on television or whatever shampoo they use when they were a child that their parents bought them or whatever when they go home is like, look, I take care of you like a VIP here. But the other forty five days between service. You do whatever you want. I don't care about you those 45 days. I only care about you the one day while you're here in the salon. That's and like, look, thing. people pay premiums. It's they're like they pay premiums to work with you. Yeah. They're barely with you ever. So right. all you have to do right. is teach them while they're there. They're only there for an hour and a right. half, sometimes three hours for some reason. You know, <laughs> teach them while they're Five there. minute haircuts, Matt. Five Focus. minute haircuts. That's all it's about. <laughs> yeah. Don't bring that up. Um, so I know. I know. Let's not go there. <laughs> couple of people on Jordan Cox. Uh, what's up to him? Johnny Livingston says in PA, we don't have to, we don't have a choice. He's saying that we don't have booth. Don't have a PA, choice. Yeah. Which is true, but right. we do have studio, right? So they do allow that because it's a different business. And you still model. have to be a good owner just because the law says it. It doesn't mean be a crappy owner and they'll work for you. They can move out of state to go to work somewhere else or they can cut right. in their damn basement. Like, you know for what sure. I mean? Uh, and, the, and Brittany's <sighs> yeah. saying, uh, is working more hours mean making more money? Well, um, yes and no. I mean, right. if the only thing you can do is work more hours, it's like, I, I think there's a bigger question that's happening here, Matt, like yeah. about this whole thing of like work equals money. And I think this is like, if I, if, if somebody catches it, if only one person in the whole podcast catches this yeah. is there's people who work for money and then there's people who invest money and let that money make more money. Yeah. That's the difference we're talking about right here is a employee trades time for money. A business owner trades their money and resources and ideas and real estate and other things. They just have other ways to make money. Yes. And, and this is the thing. I think what happens is they go, they, they, they make the leap from being a trading time for money person, like as, a, as an employee, and they make the leap to salon ownership but they're still behind the chair as an owner. And sometimes they make less money as a salon owner when they're, because they're now, you know, they were making 50 grand a year. I going to say they're making 70 grand a year as a stylist. They go and own a salon and now they only make 50 grand a year as a stylist because they have to keep their business running. Right. Right. And then right. their staff tells them, well, you're not paying me enough commission and they can barely run the salon in the damn first place. And they're like, I can't afford to pay you enough commission. I'm already taking a hit to even run this thing and keep it open. I had somebody tell me the other day, they're like, Jason, I don't want to take, because I, I said to him, you're making half as much money as you were as a booth renter. Maybe you should just go back to renting a booth. And they're like, well, Jason, I don't want to go backwards. 
And I said, well, the problem is you did go backwards. Right. And you either yeah. need to go forwards or you need to go back to the forward step of just being a renter because that was actually more forward than you are now. But the fact that they can say, I was a stylist, now I'm an owner, is a perception that they've moved forward. Yeah. It's a perception to the <laughs> outer world. I, I was a renter, but now I own a salon. I, I don't know. I think I deviated off the question, but like, no, but I, I think exactly that idea is like working more for money is, is totally, that's the catch, right? Yep. And that's where people like, I'm glad that you said that point because I think it takes you from being like, uh, don't work booth rental to like, right. Like just saying like, there's you know, reasons, there's reasons. Like when it, it's about yeah. building a business, right? You, your, your job, what you do for salons is, is help business owners grow. Um, so it's not Correct. necessarily that, uh, being a commission stylist or a booth renter is one way or the other. It's you know, building yourself a future. I got another, I got a couple more yeah. questions. So I want to pop that up. And this one, it, I'm going to give you some time to think about this one because it's actually technically, I think for me, for fundamentals of like haircutting, let's say, but I want you to take that yeah. same question and twist it yeah. into uh, your kind of thing. Business. So uh, yeah, when, it totally. comes to, when it comes to perfecting uh, your fundamental technique, what are five rules to think about? So I'll go first and I'll talk about haircutting. Totally. And then you can go, and yeah, I'd love to talk man. about that. All right. So, uh, when it comes to perfecting your fundamental technique, I actually wrote down, um, the five things that I think, and, um, the reason, See, so I want to make a video stalled for me, but then also wrote them down in advance. <laughs> yeah, I have it ready for That's myself. Okay. That's why I'm giving you time <laughs> to think. All right. So, yeah, uh, so. five rules, uh, to the fundamentals of haircutting, I'll say. So the first one I yeah. thought of was clean sectioning. So I think where, what I've noticed like over, you know, 12 years of educating and just doing hands-on classes and watching people, even after they watch, you know, me take a section or tell them how to section it out and then watch them do it. They're never clean in their sections. So, uh, that's the first thing. Make sure your sections are nice, clean and tight. And then the second thing is clean partings. So, um, if you practice anything out there, I think that practicing, taking a line sectioning and really understanding the purpose of that line. So like when I take a line for a haircut, I might take a, a diagonal forward parting and a lot of people just be like, okay, cool, diagonal forward. And it doesn't really matter what the angle of that diagonal forward parting is. For me, it matters a lot. So that that parting is where I'm basing my finger angle on how the whole haircut's gonna go. So I'll maybe go mm -hmm. right along the mm -hmm. jaw and take that diagonal parting and go with that. So think about why you're making that parting and what you're gonna do with it. Uh, the third one is even tension. So a lot of people just take a section up quickly, cut it, and you know all of it's mismatched. It doesn't really work. So when you recomb that section, you don't have a, a bold line or a strong line. That can really affect your haircuts. The fourth thing, small sections. So a lot of people take too thick of a section as they're going through a haircut. They bunch a lot together. Sometimes condensed cutting is a good option, and sometimes it's not. So you got to think about that. And then body position is the last one. You can't cut something uh, with structure if you're not structured from from your head to your toes. So make sure that you're standing in front of the section, uh, really working clean. So I'm gonna make a video about this, but I wanted to I wanted to answer your question because you asked it, uh, Olivia. So hope hope that helps, and we'll go more in depth with it in a YouTube video coming up. Your turn. Well, in the last few minutes, while I listened intently to how to cut hair that I I didn't really <laughs> because it's not my jam, uh, I was like, I hope he's not the camera's not on me because this, it like I was like hair sectioning is way over my head, uh, no pun intended. But here in the in the few minutes, yeah, no, I'm just kidding, dude. Um, <laughs> I, I was doing my best to smile. Yeah. In the last minute or so that you gave me to come up with that, I've not only. Uh, come up with my five things, but I put together a digital download and a nice. whole worksheet and all this stuff. I've already, man, I'm just that fast. <laughs> um, <laughs> nice. I actually, there, here's how I look at it. Um, I and I, do you mind if I share my screen because I can show you this? Is that cool? Wait, for real? Did can you? I can I do that? I have a button. I have a button, okay, dude. I'm here. not, yeah, I, Matt. It. I don't play around, bro. I know. Check this that's out. Why so, do you, can you see this thing? <laughs> Do you see? This I is, told you I just built this while this we were what talking. Is what happened. Built up. Yeah, nice. Yeah, I just I, I just whipped I like it together it. real quick. Thank <laughs> you for getting my sarcasm. Um, no, I actually had a tool that actually addresses this clearly that I wanted to bring up. But um, this is this is my uh, cheat sheet for professionals versus amateurs. Okay. And this is this is how I look at. It. So 
professionals, if you think about this, is like, you know, what are the fundamentals? Like, you know, professionals and amateurs, if I, I'll take it down, then I'll share this in again. So, because everybody's just going to read it for a second. Yeah. All right. Uh, all right. I took it down. So, so here's the thing, and I'll, I'll give this to you in just a sec. But the deal is, is that most people don't understand the difference between a professional and an amateur. And when you talk about fundamentals, professionals study fundamentals. Amateurs are constantly looking for new tricks and shortcuts. Okay. That's what they always right. want to know. Now, here's my definition. Like whether it's basketball, lacrosse, uh, haircutting, anything, is if you think about it, amateurs love what they do, but they don't care. So number one, amateurs love what they do, but they don't care how much they get paid for it. So basically that means they would work for free or they would play for free. Like if I'm going to, if you and I, Matt, are going to go play basketball because we love it, we're just going to go play in the backyard because it's fun or talk like, you know, we would dork out and talk about gear. Yeah. Right. And we could talk about gear till we're blue in the face, but a professional cares how much they get paid for the work that they do. So for example, you and I can dork out on gear. That's fine. But we also dork out on gear because we monetize it with our businesses and it justifies our habit. Right. Right. <laughs> it's like, exactly. I have a business that pays me money that allows me to buy cool things. Right. Yeah. So like, I care about what I get paid. You care about what you get paid. So that's the flip flop from amateur to professional. That's point number one. That's a fundamental technique. Number right. two. Amateurs don't track, measure, and manage their results. Meaning they, they're like, ah, it, you know, I make something. It's okay. I don't really care how much retail I sell. I don't care how many new guests I have. I don't care. Whatever. Like they just, I don't want to track. That's not my jam. Versus right. professionals always track and measure their results. Right? They want to know. They live by the numbers. Like, Matt, I have no doubt in my mind that you, if you lost half of your followers tomorrow, you'd be like, what the? What just happened? Like something went drastically wrong, right? Maybe that Jason guy is not always cracked up to be, <laughs> take him off the podcast, right? Right. Is yeah. it like, if you if that happened, the number tracking part of your business, or if all your sponsors left you, or something happened, like you would look at that and go, what's going on? Not yeah. like, woohoo, it's cool. I'm just having fun here. Okay, so again, right. pro versus amateur. I, uh, number three. Um, oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. That's fine. It's all good. Well, weigh in whenever, bro. I'll just, I just keep going. No, I know. I was just going to say, like, I've always kind of set myself up to have multiple eggs in the basket, right? So, like, sure. I do think about uh, salons, <clears throat> you know, a lot of times. Like, I've always set myself up so even if my staff left today, mm -hmm. it would be okay, right? I would be able right. to uh, work on, I wouldn't be happy about it. Right. I wouldn't be like, it wouldn't be a joy, <laughs> but at the same time, everything would be okay. And I would move forward and then I could rebuild in a way. So like, I think a lot of people have to think about that. I've, I've never wanted to be at the mercy of something else. Right. So I right. think that takes away your creativity. It takes away your passion for something when you, when it's, you're just trying and, and struggling to work. So like, that's something that I've always whether it's been education or whatever, I've always had something else that I could rely on yeah. just in case. Okay. Three. Well, dude, it, and it's, it's helpful because if you're, if you're only on Instagram or you're only on YouTube, it's like you have all your eggs in one basket, you'll be screwed. And that it's that too. same. I mean, again, it, it's, you know, it's, it's like, how do you diversify your income streams? And that goes back to the very first point I made about is your only source of income if you work behind the chair. Right. Not, could you also be a manager? Could you also be an educator? Do you also make money from the building? Do you have shareholders? Can you sell off your, it's like, it's about diversifying your income, but people who yeah. very often are booth renters, they only have one source of income and I'd like to fix that. And I don't mean start a freaking Arbon business on the side or, you know, start selling for Amway. What I mean is start to understand the multiple income streams that exist inside the salon world and booth yeah. renters only have one source of income. So this is my only thing. Um, yeah. So, okay. Number three, uh, amateurs don't seek outside help. They basically, they do it on their own. And, and by the way, an amateur might watch a YouTube video or they might get up to speed, but like the difference for me in my mind is a professional seeks and, and help and support from out, object, outside objective third parties, meaning they get coaching, they get advice. Cause see, there's something, and again, I, I don't think this will offend you by saying this, but, but like, if I just went on your YouTube and watched all your videos and tried to become a hairdresser, I could probably do some things, but if I've never had somebody watch me cut hair and say, oh, you're actually doing that wrong, that technique is off or like, cause I yeah. can't see what I don't know, right? So like if I just watch YouTube tu tutorials and teach myself how to cut hair, I will probably learn things wrong that I can't even see. 
Yeah. But as soon as you get that two way feedback of like, if, if I, you, you were trying to teach me how to cut hair and you'd watch me, I'd watch a video and do something. You'd be like, bro, you didn't even see that. I like this one thing is really important about you're holding it wrong. I'm like, Oh, I didn't even know that. So part yeah. of it is making sure that you get two way feedback. So again, if you're in a salon, hopefully you're in a salon that has management level feedback that gives you feedback on your ability to offer retail to your guest or to, you know, increase on your technique or watch how you're doing color or like saying like, look, it's taking you three hours to do this. Why? Let's give you some feedback on it. Right. Yeah. So getting outside help from and third party uh, feedback. Uh, the other one is amateurs only uh, develop goals. Like they go, Oh, I have a goal. I want to be a millionaire. I want to own my salon, own salon one day. I want, they did say things right. Versus professionals develop a process. They go, look, I want to own a salon and here's how I'm going to save up money to get there. I want to make a million dollars, which means I'm going to make this much from behind the chair. Then I'm going to make management salary. Then I'm going to own a building. Then I'm going to do this. Then I will have a million dollars. So like one is throwing a goal out there. The other is developing a process. Okay. Yep. So that's, I think I'm on four. Uh, five is an amateur thinks they're good enough at everything. Like I'm pretty good. I don't need to learn more about this. Like I'm really good at this. I'm really good at that. The way I see that is when I go to hair shows, like I'm going to uh, ISSE this week. Are you going to be at ISSE by the way? I'm not doing down there? shows anymore. No, Matt's like, Matt's like <laughs> screw that. I, I'm not I'm not going to these places. It's just to hang out with me, bro, not to do anything else, just to hang That's out with me. That's true. I um, should do that, but yeah. We should do that. But yeah. anyway, the, the idea is, is that when I go to hair shows, the classes on like a new color technique will fill up. And I do a class on like how to increase your income sometimes. And it's like crickets because they're like, ah, it's fine. I don't, I, don't need, I don't need to know the business side of things. Now, the big salon owners, they'll show up there. But the, the average person doesn't want to invest in business classes. So they're like, I'm good enough at business, good enough to be a renter. Um, yeah. Versus, again, a professional understands what are their weaknesses, what are their limitations, and they actively work on them. Actively. Yeah. And they're like, look, I'm not that good at this. I need to fix it. And then the last one, you said five. The gal who asked okay. said five. I gave you more. It's a bonus. Um, it's, it's a bonus tip. <laughs> Amateurs take feedback personally. Like, like if Matt, dude, and I know you don't do this because you would never survive in the world of internet if this was you, is that amateurs take feedback personally. It's like one person says, I didn't like that show yesterday. And then you're like, oh God, I got to change the show. Like that one person's offended. I didn't please everybody. So I'm, sh I'm taking it down and I'll reboot the show when everybody will like it. Versus professionals always seek feedback while taming their ego. Meaning like, it's like, you don't take it personally and say that's a personal attack on Matt Beck. What I look at, like I had somebody comment on my feed. I had I have one video that we just hit, uh, like a really a good number of views for us, and like you know, so now starting to attract you know negative comments, and it's it's the yeah. party started in my opinion. And so this one person says, blah, blah, blah. He said nothing during this entire video. And it's one of my most popular videos right now, right? right? It says, he says absolutely nothing. So I look at that person and I'm trying to decide, do I want to respond to this drama? How do I want to handle this? And I click on their thing and I go to their page. And literally everything that they've shared is them talking S on every, by the way, that's short for other things. But that's, it's people talking S on, <laughs> on every other person's stuff on their page it's just like this is yeah. dumb i hate this this sucks the world is gonna end here's a crappy post and i'm like this person is super angry and it really has nothing to do with me it just has to do with no matter what they see they're viewing it through a filter of garbage and i'm like cool and so i, I like i said that's like i don't take it personally i just take the feedback and roll forward so as a stylist is like if 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 you're if the salon owner's like hey i'd like to work with you on helping you sell more retail so you can make more money and they're like what do you mean i'm not doing my job i'm not good enough you should just pay me more commission then i won't have to worry about selling more retail my job will be that's that personal response knee jerk reaction response yeah. and so i think these things are really clutch for for really talking about working on your fundamental techniques and becoming better at what you do like you've got to become a professional and a professional works on fundamentals i like so that was great by the way you nailed that thanks um, bro i i so, just spent a minute thinking about it right before we talked it was so easy <laughs> isn't it awesome when you have that stuff <laughs> yeah so bro, i love it. it i love it so this is my I, I love the whole point of that and i think that i i definitely was somebody that for a long time and still I get a little like, cause I get negative comments every day. Right. And it's something that like, right. you know, we're trying to teach our 12 year or our 11 year old son at this point, like, you know, how to deal with like feedback. Right. It's like, yeah. Yeah. And people, I, I had a hard time. Like 
I, I guess it's because I'm getting older now, but um, you know, I would see a negative comment on on YouTube or Facebook when I I've been doing this now for eight years, but um, when I would see it, I would get like super you know bummed about it, like not bummed, but like yeah. I would it's I would, hard. I would attack, you know, like I'd be like whatever, mm -hmm. you know, like or try to prove my point or you know right. what whatever Argue it is. It. But you start to learn, like you know, you don't know. I don't know what that person's you know deal is, right? I don't care you know yeah. really that it doesn't affect you can't let it affect you um and i think that that's a good lesson for in salon relationships uh you know whether it's mm -hmm. owner stylist or stylists that work together like um you know we go through these things where the communication's not great and you know um i think that's probably one of our biggest things now in the salon is that i don't think anybody talks to each other you know like they do but they but about the important yeah. stuff you know, and everybody mm -hmm. should be able to, um, to help coach each other, like as a peer to peer thing, you know, right. and work through it. So I like that point. That's, that's definitely a, a good one. Yeah, it, dude, it's so hard. I mean, I was just doing this training, like I said, with, uh, Redkin, it was the, their rack worldwide conference in Miami a couple weeks ago. And they, they asked me to go there and to train their trainers on like how to start posting more on social media and like interacting with, lots of people because as you know being a, a a content creator in the online space like people are shying away from going to more beauty shows and going to yeah. live education and they're like they're like i can just pull it up on my phone why do i need to drive to new brunswick to go to a class like or whatever it is yeah and so this whole idea of like them doing more is good but as soon as i say okay guys we're gonna create content everybody goes oh god but then people yeah. that will say bad things and all this stuff. And like I was on stage with this girl and and we I had her do a video. I shot the video with her and I filmed her. And uh, I said, well, what did you think? And she goes, well, I, I, I talked too fast while I was on the video. And it wasn't, you know, I, it was it was way too much personality and all this stuff. And so I, I surveyed this room and this room was probably, it was like eight, 900 people. It's a lot of people. And I was like, okay, how many of you in this room think that she spoke too fast? And like six people of this room raised their hand. And then I said, how many think it was just right? Everybody else is like, totally just right. And so she goes, see, I need to work on slowing down. And I was like, wait, 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 wait. Right. You're going to change for the six people that might just not be your people. Yeah. Like they might not be. Like, you, like so many people are so obsessed about making everybody love them. And especially as hairdressers and as stylists, for crying out loud, you guys know this better than anybody else. Yeah. You want everybody to love you so much you're willing to sacrifice who you are in order to please the people who can't be pleased. True. Dude, it, it, it's, it's crazy. And again, the, the unpleased person or the angry person has been triggered by you by something that had nothing to do with you. It, has, it yeah. says more about them and who they are than you and who you are. But what happens is we as adults, you know, learn at a very early age, like we have to fit into the, the group, right? We have to fit in at school. We have to fit in at work. We have to fit in here. So if somebody doesn't like me, I better correct it. Yeah. But the problem is we haven't like evolved yet with this world of social media that gives you access to thousands or even millions of people where all of a sudden there you, you, you have to deal with people who don't like you. You just now don't have to like never see them. They're just now in your face because you've decided to put yourself out there. You've taken a risk. You're interacting with more people on your Instagram, on your Facebook page, on YouTube, or just, you know, it's like, it's like you're constantly in a giant concert on stage. That's what social media has done. And they, yeah. they've been able to put almost everybody on stage. And now you can deal with what celebrities for years have had to deal with. We're now starting to have to, as a society, deal with as the average person in very small doses. Right. Yeah. But you have to get past that idea that not everybody will like you. Not everybody will buy retail from you. Not everybody will rebook from you. And that's totally okay. Find your people. For sure. Uh, Ryan Teal's on. Do you know Ryan Teal? Yo, Ryan. No, um, but what's up, Ryan? We should so, know Ryan Teal, clearly. You should. At yeah. The way you asked that. Uh, <laughs> so um, he said, I don't take positive or negative comments on social media personally, but I care about every yep. single comment. Yeah, it's good. I would agree with that 100%. Um, I, I also want to throw out one more thing for the, on that topic, man. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I'm, I'm searching you, Ryan Teal, to find out who you are. Um, <laughs> but here's, here's what I would also say about that. Is um, I care about every comment because I, I appreciate that people are there. Um, 
But I, I also would say one other piece of advice I've had to learn as we've grown and done what we do is when taking feedback, and this is really important when you're trying to be a professional, is take feedback from people who are ahead of you on the journey in the area they're giving you feedback. Yeah. So like if I want to take uh, feedback on like how to do my podcast better, I should probably get feedback from Matt Beck. If I want feedback on like uh, my, like if I get feedback on my podcast from my mom, probably not the best person. Like I didn't like that interview you did, sweetheart. Or my mom doesn't talk like that, but I'm making a mom voice, right? Like, you know, I didn't like this or I didn't like that. Look at the people who are giving you feedback and ask yourself, are they ahead of me in that area of their life or not? Otherwise, I say thank you and ignore the feedback. Yeah, that's a personal rule I have. And it's super it's it's served me really well. I get off a big stage and somebody goes, that was really good. But I just have a comment about what you said after point three. And I'm like, do you do big events? They're like, oh, no, but I just, you know, I sit in all these audiences. I watch speakers all the time and you didn't do this. And I'm like, cool, that's not me. I don't do that. So if you don't <laughs> if you're not on these stages, I don't want your feedback. I don't say that to them. I just say thank you and then yeah. go forward. You know what I mean? For sure. Ryan said, don't look them up anyway. Oh, oh, I'm, all right. There's a lot of <laughs> he, there's a lot of Ryan Teals that don't look like you. Is all I'm saying. He, uh, I see a YouTube picture of a guy layered haircut. This very well could be you. It is. Anyway, he's been in here. We've I, we've I see it. With him. He's a Naha winner. Right on. Uh, oh. All right. So, well, bro, I'll be a Naha this week. I actually gonna be fun. we're gonna throw up one more question. Do you have time? Let's do it. Yeah, all I'm right. okay. I'm good. All right. So, um, this one comes from Cosmo Kristen. Um. She says, Cosmo. I want to know how to enforce cancellation policy for last minute cancellations or no shows better Easy. Uh, when it's not totally up to me since I'm not the owner. So that's like, that's probably a key point, <laughs> especially for repeat offenders yeah. uh, without scaring them away. Totally. Okay. Yeah. Just happened. Just happened today. I had a color yeah. service. Yep. Yep. All right. So yeah, dude. I, so I, that's been a hot topic on the, on the, uh, the inner tubes lately, man. That's been totally the deal. I've seen that one floating around. Even mm -hmm. me and Christina currently right at this moment are working yeah. up our cancellation policy. So let, yeah, it's, it's hot it. in our, we have a, a private Facebook group and our, our, uh, salons have been talking about this too. So clearly it's, it's a big thing. Um, and I, I want to say this cause I've canceled on my stylist uh, selling myself out. I've canceled on my stylist in the last three months, two different times within 24 hours. And here's what I did. I literally sent her my full amount of money that I would pay for my haircut. I Venmoed her and I was like, I'm really sorry. Like I, I just said, look, here's my cancellation policy in my business. If somebody cancels inside 24 hours, they forfeit their appointment and they pay 100% for their appointment in my business. Now, that's not a salon business. That's just my business because I treat my time sacred. I can't get time back. It's really important. I can't rebook. I can't pre-book. Now, how does that work in a salon? Because that doesn't work the same way in a salon. Okay. Right. Um, most of our salons, um, two things. I have to address all these little subtle nuances that she asked. I'm not the owner. How do I enforce the policy? My not so easy answer to hear on that is that the salon, you can't have a policy that supersedes the salons, okay? Unless you have a specific agreement with the client and customer and they make at least a verbal agreement with you, okay? So here's the thing. Most people are interested in enforcing a rule on somebody that they never got agreement with, okay? Right. So in my business, the way we teach it is that like, Matt, if you wanted to have a policy that said, look, any cancellations inside 24 hours, and this is a pretty, like the people who are doing it well, this is the policy, okay, that most people have. Okay, good. Cancellations inside 24 hours incur a 50% uh, uh, charge. So if the service okay. was supposed to be $100, it's 50% of that service gets charged to your credit card automatically. People who make online bookings, and this is policies I hear in a lot of our academies, is that, uh, or sorry, a lot of our um, salons in our academies, is they say online bookings require a deposit before booking the service. So it's a long service. It's a hundred, yeah. $200 service. It requires a 50% deposit. And then it states in the, in the cancellation policy when they book, if you cancel inside 24 hours, your 50% deposit, or it, would, it says non-refundable deposit, will be charged and not returned. Yeah. Okay? So that's, that's a general salon policy, though, that if the owner chose to adopt, they could do. But that has to have the agreement in advance. You can't just take somebody who said, well, I booked an appointment. I didn't show up. You're like, fine. 
pay me that 50%. Otherwise, you can't come back because there was no agreement for that rule. Like they didn't agree to that in advance. So people will follow rules if you set them up. It's like when you drive down the street, there's a speed limit sign. And we all have an agreement that we make with DMV that says, if I, and the DMV and the police, if I get on the road to drive my car and I break the speed limit, there's a chance I will get a ticket. Yeah. Right. We all know that from getting on the road, but it's an agreement we make to drive the car. So if there's no agreement in the salon, the only thing you can do is sit and have a conversation with your guests and say, look, uh, Samantha, right? Samantha, who came in and, and canceled last time. He's like, look, Samantha, um, here's the deal. I know you had to cancel in 24 hours and I know emergencies come up. Um, that's totally fine. And the first one, I always, it's a cancellation. Like that's totally fine and it's good. But I, I need to let you know that I can't replace that time. Like I can't reschedule somebody if you cancel on me the same day in the morning. It's really hard. I'm totally full. So just in the future, I just want to make this agreement if it's okay with you. Is that if for some reason that happens in the future, every appointment is going to require a deposit. And um, if for some reason that cancellation happens in the 24 hours, then it's at least 50% of what your service is. And I do that because I can't replace my time. Would you be okay if I did that? Now, if she says, screw that, I don't want to work with you anymore. I hate you. Die. Well, she probably wasn't a very good client in the first place. That's number one. Exactly. Number two, if she says to you, you know what, that's, that's a lot. And I just, it's, it's a really hard thing for me to swallow that I didn't get a service done. Um, but it's going to take me money Then go, well, look, but here's the problem is like, I, I have a fully booked schedule or, you know, I respect my time and I just, I can't, I can't lose that time because it's too important for me and my family and whatever. Okay. Now, if, if she's having a good conversation with you and she goes, well, look, and, and, and I, I would say this, I don't want to take your 50% deposit ever. Is that clear? And by the way, this works the other way around. If I'm a stylist, this is really hard to hear too. If I'm a stylist and I get sick and I have to cancel on you, then I'll give you 50% off your next service. Yeah. You want to really great. F somebody up is say it, it goes the other way too. Is it because I've had my stylist. She's like, look, I'm really sick. I have to cancel on you today. And I'm like, F I have an event this weekend. I have this, like <laughs> right. it screws yeah. me up. Yeah. So like, what's my return? So I think two things, whatever the agreement is, it needs to be agreed to in advance. That's number one. Number yeah. two, um, it has to go both ways. And then the other thing is if the owner doesn't have a policy uh, you have to be really careful about that. And I would just say, you need to sit down with the owner and say, I'd like to set up a policy. And if the owner is fighting you on that, like then you're stuck. That's the whole thing about a lack of leadership in the salon industry is then the only thing you can do is have a conversation with your guest and have a separate arrangement with them. For crying out loud, you've got them in a chair for 30 minutes to an hour to maybe, what did you say, Matt? Maybe three hours? Uh, yeah. that, that maybe, right? Maybe um, there's some conversation you can have. And by the way, this just comes with loving and valuing yourself and valuing your time. Because if yeah. you don't value it, nobody else will. And they'll just learn that it's okay to cancel on you and there's no consequence. And Did that help is, at all? Do you, you get yes. any value out of that? I don't know. That was great. So that's good. Cool. And and my take on it is there's a, there's a lot of things that lead to you being super frustrated that somebody cancels as well. And I think that it's yeah. another insurance policy that I kind of put into place when I book people I will book a couple people a, within the same amount of time. Like, so I utilize my downtime. So I mm. do double book. Mm -hmm. I don't double book to where I need an assistant for sure. Sometimes I need a little bit of help, which comes back to you working with a team. But at the same time, and right. everybody should help each other, which is the, the other thing. But I book so that if somebody cancels, I still have someone within a half an hour coming in. And we're getting into mm -hmm. this point where we're in this age of like a color and a cut takes three hours and we can't do anybody else in that three hours. And we're going to try to charge them 400 exclusively three hours. <laughs> right. 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 So it's three hours. We're trying to charge 400 bucks. And then when that person cancels, because first off, they don't think you're, it's worth 400 bucks. So they, they thought they would rebook. And then now they're thinking, I don't want to spend the 400 bucks. So I'm going to cancel. And I'm going to come back mm -hmm. in in a month. You know, that's what happens. And then now you've got a three hour gap in your day and you're not making any money. And now you're upset. And now we're turning into, we yeah. need a cancellation policy. Yeah. I've I never, want to get them. Damn it. It's their fault. I get to the point where somebody cancels. I'm like, Oh, thank God. <laughs> Cause now I can, I can like, I, dude, my breathe, schedules look like but, that too, but I still have somebody, you know? So like, and, right. and that was back when I was booking, you know, my day all up, but this is where, you know, it goes back to the fundamentals that you're talking about. Communication. Um, yeah. We yeah. had a client who would call and be kind of rude 
uh, to the receptionist all the time. It was one of my clients. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, he was coming in. And one day he was rude on the phone again because he couldn't get in the time he wanted. Um, he always cancels. And then when he wants in, he wants in. And so, you know, that day I did his haircut. And then as he's walking out, I walked him outside and I talked to him and I said, you know, you're rude on the phone and we need to fix this Mm -hmm. because you're making people uncomfortable when you come in. And he was like, oh, you know, like he was surprised. Right. We went through this whole conversation. It was great. He now comes. He doesn't cancel. He comes in when his appointment is. He's super nice to everybody. Um, Mm -hmm. It's communication. Like we don't yeah. talk. If you have a client, it, it's, it's also not though up, like you, man. To them. It's you. It's it's your confidence in being able to have that confrontational conversation. I don't mean confrontation like you're gonna go box him in the parking lot, but it's your confidence and ability to say like, dude, hey, can I bring something up? And, and by the way, this is my softener. I would say, can I bring something up with you that's hard for me to even bring up with you? Yes. Would that be okay? That's a good one. That's good. Yeah. Right. And you're like, you're, it's really hard for me to bring this up, but are you okay if I if I try to bring something up that's uncomfortable for me? And they're like, yeah. You're like, look, man, like I, some some of the people here think that you're kind of rude and I like I don't get that vibe, but like I'd like to figure out what that is and I need to fix it. Now you might be like, dude, you're rude, fix it. I don't know. But like just no, that idea, like it really is like your confidence is so helpful. And I hope people kind of hear your confidence. And that's probably why people like watching your stuff, dude, is your confidence. Like, man, I wish I was like that because they can kind of feed off that and do it. But that's where it goes back to that fundamentals of like, what are you doing mentally to keep yourself focused? What are you doing to sharpen, not just your scissors and that skill, but what are you doing to mentally sharpen what you're doing? That's what we do is that mental sharpening. Yeah. And that's why I wish like, um, and that's like my frustration with hair shows too, is, you know, I would go there for social media classes and my classes, you know, would have a good amount of people, but at the same time, people like people aren't understanding what is important in this business. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not mm-hmm. just yeah. doing hair and doing it well. It's understanding that it's hard work and, you know, sometimes you're doing things you don't want to do. And like, you just have to, like, you should be booking differently. You should be like, people need to take a second and just think about like what, um, why things are affecting them the way they are. You know what I mean? Like it shouldn't be like, Oh, it's the salon owner. I've got to go do this. I, I got to quit and go do this or whatever. Like this, right, right, right. This, you got to look at yourself and what, what are you doing to cause that stuff? Somebody that is canceling on you all the time, there's probably a bigger reason why they don't show up for their appointment than them not wanting to get their hair done. You're not the dentist. You should be an enjoyable experience. Like, or maybe they are busy, (laughs) but then that's where like, I'll tell a client, like, you know, you just can't pre-book. You got to call me and I hope I can get you in, but you know, Mm -hmm. you you cancel often and, and my time is valuable and I can't, I can't take that gap, you know? So there's like, or, there's or no, like, dude, yeah. The, or know yeah. that like that busy person who runs a credit, that's the attorney that always has some last minute emergency. Uh, like me, I can afford to pay for that appointment that I didn't show up to. Like, it's very normal. And yeah. again, sometimes you ask them is like, you, this is a very, like, if you don't say it passive aggressively, this is something you can say is like, if they're an attorney or a lawyer or whatever is like, what's your policy? If somebody shows up late for, if, if, sorry, if somebody no shows you at your business, what's the policy? Yeah. Just like, I just genuinely, and you have to genuinely want to know, not go like, well, what's the policy if somebody's late at your business? You <laughs> right. Ask yeah, it that way. Right. But like, you know, just say like, look, I respect my time. What's your policy? And if they're like, oh, well, it's cool. They can be late no matter what. If we have infinite, you know, we have infinite, you know, things because people have that problem. Like, okay, well, that's cool for your business. I can't do that with mine, unfortunately. So here's how I've decided to make that happen. If you want to remain a client, here it is. The other well, one last thing on that, Matt, that just comes up. Yeah. Uh loyalty programs and reward programs. The other amazing thing, if you're a salon owner that has a staff and you have a loyalty program that's watching this, um, if you have a loyalty program, you can work into your loyalty system that they they have like basically a a reward only applies if they've never canceled an appointment. Like the part of your loyalty system says in order to be a VIP for us, it means you can't ever cancel within 24 hours. If it does, you eject yourself and lose all your points from your loyalty system. So it's like, there's another repercussion for that. If you don't want to like charge them money because you're freaking out about that, just say, well, then we'll take it out of your loyalty points or we'll take it out. It just, just gives some sort of consequence and it makes a big difference. It can be small, but it makes a big difference. 
No, that's totally anyway, good. I hope that's helpful. I think people should do should focus more on that stuff. That's something we had to like when we had the old Millennium. So we use Millennium software and uh, we switched mm -hmm. to Mevo. And I haven't had a loyalty system for a while. We we were jumping like I keep I keep getting these alerts. You know the Facebook like memories or whatever. And it's all these like yeah, yeah. flyers that I create. You know we created a long time ago. There was like you know six ways to salon gratitude. And it was like all these different like super complicated loyalty things. But um, I yeah. need to relaunch a loyalty program. That's number one. Number two, yeah. um, I I think that I don't know if Mevo has it. Honestly, I haven't even uh, checked. But I don't know if you do you know that. You don't know that. Uh, I don't know. I, I yeah. no, these are things I I'll don't have to know. Check. Sorry, but man. yeah. So um, but yeah, loyalty programs are awesome because it allows people mm -hmm. to um, you know, to have those goals set. And I like the idea of if you do cancel an appointment, it, it you know, it affects that. So yeah, pretty cool. Yeah, and you can set you can set that up in the software for sure, and in most softwares you can set up some of those things. Yeah. Yeah, and even if you don't, you know, if you're using probably whatever your payment system is, like the Square and all those, those have loyalties too mm -hmm. uh, through that. So totally, almost everything does at this point. Sweet. So anything else you want to talk about? Are you good? How are you feeling? Dude, I'm pretty good. I, I just want to say, Matt, I, dude, it's always awesome. And I was just going to say, one of these days, I'm going to have to have you come out to one of our Academy events. Dude, you're welcome anytime. You know, we yeah. do our retreats three times a year. And you should come out to one of our retreats, dude. I think you'd, you, all these things that you're like excited to talk about, that's what we talk about for two days. And I'd love to get you yeah. into one of those spaces at some point. So, dude, you have yeah, to take it anytime. Just know I'd love to have you out. But I, I just appreciate you doing this because I think this is the topic that nobody in the general world of hair celebrity you know and that thing is like like this idea of like hey you're somebody cool that people look at look at you're talking about the hard topics and i think you said it everybody wants to like hey here's this new cut here's this new technique and you're willing to dive deep on these business issues that are not every day so i just want to thank yeah. you for doing the work that i think is needed to change the industry bro thank you well you too man and it's always fun uh it's cool and you talk about like you should the people that are doing something uh you know, one step ahead of you, like the way that you understand online marketing, like that's, that's the one thing that for me, whenever I have a conversation with you, I learn uh, something about that. Like you, you know, the ins yeah. and outs, I know how to create content, but I'm not the best at figuring out how to market it. Um, you know, and you've always got like, it amazes me when you have like, you can pull up that form and then you can send it here and they're going to sign up here. And now all of a sudden you got them on a list. Like, yeah, I'm yeah, probably yeah. on six of your lists and I don't even know it because of the way that you kind of yeah, that's push okay. things around. So it's cool. Um, and you know, Thanks, I love man. having you on this podcast. So if everybody out there, uh, especially if you're a commission salon owner and you're looking for more information on Jason's stuff, just high performance salon. Is there, is there a website? Yeah, um, just high performance salon or comment, you know, drop a comment below. And, and uh, if you want that form that I had or anything else, if you go to high performance salon, we have so many resources to give, give you guys. I just, you know, I always want it to be like, we have free, uh, we have free quizzes. We have all kinds of free stuff. There's tons and tons and tons of resources available. And uh, yeah, just give us a call if you want some help, if you want to grow your commission salon. But I would just say like my, my job to help give you guys so much value that it's ridiculous. And I like, I love being in a spot. This lady told me yesterday, I gave her a tip at a thing and she called me up and she goes, Jason, you, you made me like five or 10 grand last week because something you said. I like to give so that you get value before we even do business together. Do you know what I mean? Like take one of the tips you got from today, do, do apply it in your salon, make a change, go, hey, this guy might actually know something. Then call us and get more because there's more where that is, you know? That's how sure. it That's awesome, man. So well, thanks, bro, for having me on. Yeah, I appreciate everybody it. Everybody follow Jason and uh, I'm, I'll have you back for short. Like, this is just fun. Uh, like yeah, I said, but I appreciate hopefully it. Hopefully, my next podcast isn't the next time I have you, though, because, like, that would be. <laughs> I got to get better. There was holidays and things, man. There That's was holidays and things, yeah. So I'm going to get better. We'll blame that. We'll blame Being that. more consistent, but every few shows, I got to have you on because there's just so much to talk about. So, all right, man. Let's do Thanks it, man. so much. And, uh, all right, bro. Thank you guys. All right, I'm going to click over to here. Thank you guys so much for watching the show, uh, being a part of it being live on here there were so many people on live today uh which is really Ooh, cool can't wait to you know sift through all the comments and everything but thank you guys so much and uh we'll see you on the next show <laughs>